Hello and welcome to the Sales Lab from Homebridge Financial, where we discuss the best sales ideas, strategies, and solutions for today's housing market. Our program is designed to share the best practices and market intelligence with builders and new home sales professionals so you can find success regardless of market conditions. Our host is Anthony Grass, National Sales Director for Homebridge Financial's Builder Division, who will lead in today's conversation. Subscribe to this podcast to bookmark this link so you can find your way back for future episodes. And now our host, Anthony. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sales Lab, where we bring you the best sales ideas and strategies and solutions for today's housing market. My name is Anthony Grass, host of today's program. Today's topic is all about how we as sales leaders and our sales teams should prepare for any upcoming shift in the market. Now, what am I talking about? The market's red hot. Yes, the market is red hot, but real estate is cyclical, which means when it is hot, it eventually will slow down. You know, today's market is very challenging. And while it is very strong, we're seeing a lot of problems and, and challenges that sales leaders and salespeople have not encountered before. Right now, we, we have no inventory. Construction times are approaching a year, if not longer. We're overrun with sales leads that we're struggling to keep, that we're struggling to follow up with. We have rapidly rising prices of construction. We struggle to price the homes, let alone pre-sell them and an ever growing workload. And in the middle of this, as sales professionals, we're still expected to sell homes. So how do we manage in this environment, let alone prepare for an upcoming yet unknown market shift? So to help answer those questions today, I've asked Ryan Taft to be on our program. Ryan is part of the team of Jeff Shore uh, Consulting and they are a phenomenal sales training team if you have not seen them they are in my opinion one of the best in the country and have a great content ideas and information now ryan personally uh, was the national sales trainer for a top five builder and has over 20 years experience in real estate i've heard him speak many times and i really am going to welcome his ideas and input in this crazy market that we're experiencing right now. You know, it's a great market, but why doesn't it feel good? So Ryan, welcome to the program. Hey, hey, glad to, uh, glad to be here. Always fun to chat with you, Anthony. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And uh, I appreciate you being on. You know, it, it's strange times we're in right now, you know, and the market is so darn strong, but there's so many challenges. And when you and I were talking the other day, you know, one of the one of the concerns that I raised is we are in a cyclical market and we don't know if, you know, real estate is going to thrive for the next 12, 18, 24, 36 months or if there's going to be a market shift. So if I'm a sales professional, you know, how do you prepare for the unknown? And one of the things that came to mind was preparation of any kind really needs to be focused on on the buyer right? We're, whatever our strategies are moving forward, we have to understand our buyers first. So let's just talk about buyers to, as it, as to start out here. What do buyers expect from the sales process today and from the builder in this environment? You know, that is, uh, we could do the whole entire podcast on that question alone. You know, Part of answering that question is looking at what are people experiencing that is not favorable to them right now. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give you an example of this. To, to, sometimes I like answering questions with bad examples. <laughs> so um, I have a friend of mine who just moved here to the Phoenix area where I live, mm -hmm. and uh, she is house hunting. That is, that's what she's doing. Now, she didn't have an appointment, and uh, she just decided to go out. You know, remember like we used to do? Like just go out? And sure enough, she comes across a, a, a new community in an area she's studying. She goes up to the door and there's a sign on the door that says, you know, appointment only, which is, you know, pretty common. Mm -hmm. And just like any other buyer, she sees the salesperson sitting at the desk and tries to like, you know, hey, I'm over here, right? And of course the salesperson's like, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. Well, we're already off to a bad experience just right here. Mm -hmm. So the first part of this is to say, what do buyers want to experience is, uh, attention, right? That, that, that for sure. 
And in a market where there's so much demand and so many people on waiting lists, I think people are feeling a little ignored. So one is that attention. And that's not even a buyer need. That's a human need. Mm -hmm. So so she finally gets the salesperson's attention. And as the salesperson makes eye contact, she starts pointing at the sign. Appointment only. <laughs> and she's like, I only have one question. It's like this kind of like conversation between glass. And finally, the salesperson realizes she's got to get up and actually talk to this customer. Imagine that. And she gets up and she does something very fascinating. And this is coming from this friend of mine. And the salesperson does this as she gets up. <sighs> and rolls her eyes as she's making her way to the door. So strike number two. Buyers don't just want tolerance. They, they, they want excitement around the fact. Remember when we used to be excited that people would come in? We'd be like, yay, traffic. Now it's like, oh. Somebody's coming to my office. I don't have time for this. So it, it, buyers look at it. They don't, they, they want that attention and that connection. Anyway, she, she, the salesperson cracks open the door like she's living in the worst part of New York where there was just a murder on the street. What, what do you want? Like there's three chains on the door. She's like, I just have one question. What is it? And she answers the, and then she shuts the door and starts saying, make an appointment, make an appointment. Anyway, bottom line is it was a horrible customer experience. And so what, what do buyers want? I think buyers want attention. They, they, they want to feel like you actually care to have their business. And this is true whether it's a new prospect coming in because they don't know their number 412 on the waiting list. They still feel like, hey, I'm a customer. I'm a person. And, it, in, and the folks that are in backlog, the same exact thing. There's a lot of people being ignored just because maybe either a lack of resourcefulness or we're overwhelmed. And we'll get into that, of course. But I think that's the number one thing is, hey, recognize that I am here. Yeah. And, and that's something, uh, I mean, that, that speaks to the core, right? That speaks to the really what people uh, want. And it's so difficult in this environment with uh, all of the things that I outlined, you know, no inventory and I'm overrun with sales leads and we're trying to catch up with workload. So yeah, attention, absolutely. You know, one of the things uh, that I've seen, especially over this last year, is really the maturing of the millennial buyer. Right now, the millennial buyer represents almost 50% of new home buyers uh, out there. And these are buyers that are under 40 years of age. Um, what I'm seeing right now is an average age of about 33. Mm -hmm. And I'm sharing that just because these are these are technology natives, right? They're not an immigrant. You know, I, I learned technology. They grew up with technology. And, um, you know, in the last year with COVID, to your point on the sign, you know, make an appointment. A lot of this, a lot of activity, sales activity has shifted online. So big buyer cohort, new behaviors. How has that changed the sales process this year? Well, it, it's changed everything. I mean, I don't, you know, if you go back to reading like Dan Pink's book to sell as human in that book, he says, and that came out several years ago, he said sales has changed. I think he says something like more in the last 10 years than the last 50 years combined. I think in the last year, it's done even more change than that. You know, we had to pivot to go to how to teach people how to sell homes via Zoom or whatever platform. And to a millennial, they're like, thanks for finally catching up, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because to them, we, the, the, the kind of, we've done business the same way for 50 years in the home building industry. Someone's driving around, they see some signs or someone flipping a sign around. Oh, we should go look at a home. And then you come in, you fill out a reg card and you spend all this time. Well, to them, they're like, I don't understand why I can't just go online, figure out what I want, make this a quick process and push a buy button. Like that's kind of the, the, mm -hmm. the millennial generation really does follow the, the, the kind of mental shortcut, the heuristic of easy equals right. And our industry, unfortunately, has complicated the process just by sticking to old ways. So it really is a push for us to change. And, and, and I think, I think, uh, I think there's certain segments of the home building industry that have responded appropriately and there's others that are still dragging their feet, trying to stay in the past. And so, yeah, they're, 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 they're coming and you can either ignore it, um, or you can change with it. And I think the right answer is to change with it and get really good. That means more online sales presence. That means quicker responses, more better technology on how to get appointments set up, how to make it easy. I, I challenge everyone, who's in this right now as a sales leader to go through the process of what it takes to get through your home buying process and ask yourself, if I was a millennial right now who grew up to your point, Anthony, on technology, would I be frustrated with this process 
or would I be like, oh, this one was a piece of cake? And yeah, you, give you your answer. You know, you raise you raise you raise an absolute great point um, about the selling expectation. I had a builder say say this to me, and it was their epiphany. We've been forcing buyers to buy the way we want to sell, not the way they want to buy. Yeah. And I think when, when you talk about how you prepare for a market shift, it's not just the economic shift that may happen or when it will happen, but it's this behavioral change as well. So it's really raising that awareness of not only, you know, cyclical real estate sales, but also now we have some different buyers. And to your point about online, we're seeing a lot of feedback from these younger buyers where they are online to streamline the process, to reduce hurdles to the process, to get to the finish line faster. You know, they don't need to get in their car for everything. They'd love to select it, upgrade it, work on their financing, get it reserved, do everything they can, then sign paperwork. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a rapidly changing world right now. Well, let's talk, let's, let's, shift gears a little bit and talk about risk um, and specifically risk to the builders. Now this could be, this can be business risk. It can also be behavioral risk. You know, what type of risks uh, are you seeing or are you concerned about that, that are cr being created in this market for builders? Well, let's talk the, the, the financial business risk at first, because right now we're in a really unique position where builders are having a really hard time. And if you're a sales leader watching this, you're like, yeah, duh, I know. But they're having a really hard time trying to figure out, how do I price a home? Like, it, th those fixed costs are no longer fixed, right? It's, it, it's a moving target. And so what you're seeing is people who jumped the gun and sold out a majority of their business plan on the front half of the year are now going, uh-oh, we might actually lose some money on these deals because the cost to build those are ramping up so much while people are in production. So a couple of solutions that people have come up with, and, and there's a little bit of risk in each one of these. One is, and I've seen this, I actually have a letter from a home builder that basically is encouraging their sales team to cancel anything and everything they can so they can resell them at higher margins, which not great uh, customer experience. I don't recommend that. Uh, the, the second one is to go to sort of a, a, a highest and best offer, which, you know, the risk in that obviously would be that you may or may not get a home as a, as a consumer but you'll know the price because you bid on it. The risk to the, to the home builder is a little bit of PR issues if you're doing that mm -hmm. on the same floor plan in the same neighborhood where you've got one home that went for you know, 10,000 over asking, the other one went for 80,000 over asking. Well, those people are gonna get together, <laughs> right? So it's a little different than the resale market where it's totally spread out this is in a community. And then the third one is where you're seeing people do escalation clauses, which, uh, which I'm seeing, you know, there was a survey, it was a home builder index survey said 47% of builders are, are opting to go this route which basically says as the cost of building the home goes up, we are able to increase the price. Now, there's a lot of talk around how to do that, but all three of those bring their own risks. But I think the biggest risk of all is mm -hmm. trying to do things the way that we used to. And this market is forcing innovation. It's forcing creativity. So the biggest risk, Anthony, is doing nothing and just hoping things go back the way they were. I, I would agree with you. And I, I, I had a conversation with a builder the other day who was doing long-term pre-sale and had to pull back from that, both for production capacity, as well as rapidly escalating prices, uh, not prices, uh, construction costs. Yeah. And so we're seeing everybody adapt. They've moved their model to a four month pre-sale from a 12 month pre-sale because they wanted to get through framing and some of the most expensive components before they set the price. So yeah, we're seeing uh, people become very creative, builders become very creative, but to your point, we have to, we have to continue to adapt uh, to what's going on because this is really uncharted territory that we're in right now. Let's. I want to get your ideas on on just a couple strategies uh, or thoughts on strategies for how to address a couple problems I get asked a lot about. So, a lot of conversation with. I have three hundred, five hundred, five thousand active leads looking for homes. I've got nothing to sell. How do I engage these people? How do I try and retain them so that I can create? you know, a pool of future buyers that, that doesn't just walk away from me. Do you have any thoughts or best practices or ideas on that? 
Yeah. Well, the first thing is not to look at it as that many people, because I think people get overwhelmed when they think about how many people I need to manage. So, right, whatever you focus on tends to get mm -hmm. magnified. So if you're thinking, I got to manage a lead pool of 6,000, well, there's probably 6,000 people that have expressed interest, but there's probably a much smaller amount that have what we would call at Shore Consulting a, a really extremely high motivation or a motivation that is, that is leaning towards that. So I'll give you an example. You might have somebody who uh, is thinking about moving because maybe their neighborhood's gone downhill a little bit, but it's not very traumatic. Like my aunt. My aunt Nancy is a perfect example. She lives in Buckeye, Arizona. It's not the best area where she lives, but it's not the worst area either. She's lived there for 14, 15 years. And now she's a little nervous because a couple of rentals have gone in where homeowners were and she's not sure what's going to happen. Well, she's not someone, she might get on a list, but she's not someone who's going to be massively urgent. But mm -hmm. on the flip side, you might have somebody who looks at what's going on in their neighborhood. And so, for example, uh, my good friend Chelsea Timmons, who uh, works over at uh, TriPoint, she, when she was on the sales floor, she had a couple who had a drive-by shooting that they weren't even telling her about. Like, they weren't, like, you know, they didn't want to, like, hey, you know what, we should go have a conversation with the salesperson and tell them about how our house got shot up. No. Instead, they just played it like we we're just looking, right? Well, she was able to pull out this, this event that happened. Mm -hmm. And that person, in my opinion, if you had two leads sitting next to each other, my aunt and this couple who had this drive-by, obviously the one with the drive-by has the higher motivation. So the first thing is to segment that out, just like we would do in any lead pool, to say who are the extremely urgent, who are the somewhat urgent, who are the non-urgent. Mm -hmm. And that helps you direct your efforts. Now, the, the next piece of this is, you know, we have this phrase at Shore Consulting that says, if you know your customer well enough, they'll show you how to sell them a home. And right mm -hmm. now people are going, uh, that's great. I don't have anything to sell them. <laughs> well, okay, well, let's change that phrase to, if you know your customer well enough, they'll show you how to keep them engaged through the process of waiting. Why? Because if we all agree people buy emotionally, which I've never met anyone that disagrees with that, they buy emotionally, right. then the question is, well, what is going on with their emotions that has them on the list in the first place? And we believe that the greatest indicator of someone's personal urgency is their level of dissatisfaction. What's wrong with where they're coming from? Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing we believe is that dissatisfaction tends to grow over time. So if, you, if your dissatisfaction is your, you have two kids, two boys, ages eight and nine, they're driving everyone crazy. They got toys, they're starting to get some friends, they're starting to smell a little bit, they're getting louder, right? <laughs> Anyone who has teenagers is like, yeah, I know what's coming. Well, that, that does not get better. They get bigger, they get louder, they get more stuff, they get more friends, mm -hmm. and that dissatisfaction will grow over time. So what you need to hold on to is not just, am I sending them updates, am I updating? It's how are you connecting with their mission, their emotion, their reasons for moving, and staying connected to that. So, Anthony, it's like you and I. So you and I will talk, we'll, we'll do an event like this, I'll see you at one of our 4-2 mm -hmm. academies or our summit, and... And every time I see you, we don't have to start over and be like, hi, I'm Ryan. What's your, no, we pick right up. It's like, all right, well, how are the kids? How's the six pack goal going? Right. We can, we can have those conversations because we have relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason it's weird to call these people over time is because the number one thing is salespeople say, I don't have anything to update them. with." Don't think of updating. Think about connecting. And that would be my advice on that. Excellent. Thank you. That, that uh, I like how you broke that down, you know, into level of urgency as well. I think that's important and not to get overwhelmed by the numbers because it can be completely overwhelming on that. So I, I want to go I want to go back um, to your salesperson who rolled the eyes and tried to talk through the window there. So yeah. I already know the answer. Does a hot housing market dull our sales skills? Right. Do do we do we not hone our disciplines during hot housing markets? I, I would say with my sales team, you know, I see that right. Hot, hot markets, you relax. And as the market shifts and all of a sudden you're back in there. I mean, yeah. is, is this what you see as well? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, it's 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 the thing, you know, it's kind of like having a conversation with a VP of finance who's like, I don't understand why we need sales training. We're selling homes. And I'm sitting here going, yeah, but the behaviors to get those <laughs> sales are, have disappeared. It's not about the result of the sales. If that was it, well, great. But that's not it. It's about the behaviors that got us there. So one of the exercises that I do uh, with folks is I have them write down the behaviors they think they will need if the market was to flatten. Not, not dip, just flatten. Just be competitive again. You know, we're you have to actually talk to a buyer about, you know, buyer's remorse again. Right now, you don't have to do that. You're like, oh, you want to cancel? Sweet. 
<laughs> next now serving number 47 right or or it's you've got a competitor that is offering an incentive or they're 30,000 less than you for a bigger floor plan like sales skill stuff you, we're not right. going to do any of that and so the challenge is if you look at human nature anthony and it's actually outlined pretty good in this book thinking fast and slow by daniel mm -hmm. kahneman right the the father of uh, behavioral economics he says that people will gravitate towards something called the law of least effort that says once i reach a result here and i'm happy with it i'll start peeling back my efforts that got me there to the lowest amount i have to do to still maintain that result well the problem in this market is you can you can take your behavioral levels to zero and probably still maintain the same result well what happens when the market shifts you're at zero so my whole entire mantra is really what we're talking about here it's don't get prepared stay prepared i hate hearing this well we got to get back to basics i'm like why'd you leave them but it happens all the time it's, it's 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 the reason i still have a job frankly is because human nature often wins out and then i have to come in and talk about discipline and habits and behavior and practice when you don't want to and you don't think you need to excellent well ryan i want to ask you a little more um about you know planning for the future right so we have you know a crazy market right now we're, we're being dynamic we're changing we're adapting we're getting used to the new buyer cohort but we also have to prepare for potentially a slowdown in the market i mean there's we're going to run into a cycle somewhere we don't know where so how should a salesperson or a sales manager or even the builder or maybe they all do the same thing how should they prepare for change, and I guess this is a homework question, right? What should they be doing? Yeah, so it, it, it really is the question, how do you prepare? Because it's not a matter of if change is coming, it's a matter of when. You know, mm -hmm. when we saw the 2008 change, it would, I think it happened on a Tuesday at 2.45 in the afternoon, I think was when it happened, <laughs> with no warning. And so, you know, I'm always of the opinion, better to be prepared and not need the skills than to need the skills and not be prepared. So I would be looking at really if you were to be in a competitive market once again how do you how do you stay how do you stay employed how do you stay on top of your game not only how do you stay employed how do you thrive in that environment and so uh I, mostly for salespeople, i talk about this um there's a whole we, we're going to cover this for sales leaders at our sales leadership summit so salespeople, i would be again looking at four different areas to do some homework on to your point and that is number one is finding out the deficiency in your curiosity skills. Now, right now, you don't have to be too curious to make a sale. And I do believe curiosity is the number one trait of a great salesperson, mm -hmm. and actually a great communicator. But people aren't curious. Oh, you want a home? Great. Let's go. But there's no why. What's going on in your world? Why is that? And getting that story. So I would be practicing curiosity like crazy before you need to. And the good news is you can do that with anybody. You could do it with someone who's serving you lunch. You could do it in an Uber, you could do it with your family and you should do it with your family, right? Uh, so that, I'd practice curiosity because that's going to get you the understanding of why that customer is in front of you more so than what they want. People buy on the emotion of why, not on the feature of what. The second thing uh, homework wise I'd be looking at as a sales professional is I would be looking at the ability to overcome objections. Right now that skill is dead in the water. Why? Because they don't have to. So right now if you get an objection, the only solution I would see people do in absence of practicing that is to throw money at it. Well, what if I gave you a washer dryer? And that's what we saw in 08. We actually saw it with mm -hmm. our backlog of cancellation, which I would call an objection, right? So how good are you at being able to do that before you need to? So that's the second skill. The third mm -hmm. one's going to sound really dumb, Anthony. I mean, this is going to sound stupid. I can't even believe I'm going to say this. But the third skill that people really need to work on is asking for the sale. Well, Ryan, wait a minute. We're all making sales. Don't... How, just, yeah, but are you really the one asking? And my, my experience right now is we're not. What, what's that? People are saying, we're saying, mm -hmm. so do you have any other questions? How do I get on your list? That's them asking. What do I need to do to buy a home? Do you still have this home available? That's them doing that. So that's like going to the gym, watching someone else working out, assuming that you've done the reps. That's not how it works. You've got to practice that skill. So I would get into that habit really fast because that one right there will get you out of the business. You don't have that. And the yeah. fourth one, um, and you, 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 you and I have talked about in this past. In fact, it's somewhere up here. Right, it's right there. Follow up and close the sale, right? Uh, is follow up. Right now, nobody's following up like they should because they don't have to. At, at, at a time, more so than I've ever seen before. 
And so we're really harping on those four things as far as the core behaviors to mm -hmm. really get prepared for. You know, we look at sales as a performance art, and that means that there's practice involved. I mean, if you look on my, my phone, and I do this religiously because I, it works, is uh, I record myself regularly. I mean, I could go through and just show you recording after recording after recording of me practicing things. And uh, I think too many people try to wing it. And here's the problem. When the market levels out, you have too much emotion of, oh my gosh, am I going to get paid? Am I going to survive? Da, 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 that your, your winging it will be mm -hmm. tainted because of the emotion. No, no. A professional gets so prepared that no matter what their emotions do, they show up on point no matter what's going on. No matter what's going on, they show up and they show up right because it's, it's in the muscle. It's ingrained, if you will. Yeah. And those are excellent. Let's go through those again. Curiosity. That was number one. Number two was... Overcoming objections. Okay, number two is overcoming objections. Follow up, and then well, the final close. Close. Oh, and close. Then sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Close, and then yeah. follow up. Those yeah. are great, and I think curiosity for me, I interpret that as asking good questions, being prepared yeah. to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. To me, that is vitally important because if you understand the buyer's motivation, that's everything. That really well, is. That's that's that says so yeah. much. It's like you were saying, like, how do you, how do you segment an a, a, a interest list of 600 people? Will the real Slim Shady please step forward, right? That's, I mean, you're, you're looking <laughs> for who, and not who's got the highest FICO, because you could have all the money in the world, and if you don't have any motivation to move, you're not my buyer. So I want to know who's got the motivation. And there's something about this market that should be teaching us about human behavior more so than any other time, and it's this. I, I ask the question of, of people in, in classes I do, how many of you would not buy a home right now? You just wouldn't do it. And, and more than half of the people raise their hands. They're in the industry and they're like, nope, I wouldn't do it. And I'm like, why? Hassle factor. I don't want to go through the struggle. I don't know the pricing, all the reasons why people don't buy. So well, the buyers are experiencing those same feelings of, you know, should we buy right now? And this is a hassle. And we've been rejected by 30 different resale homes. We even overbid $100,000 and we still lost out. So why are they still there? Well, the only reason that you're still standing there trying to get a home in, with all of that hassle to get a home means there's something big going on in your life that you're willing to push through all that garbage to do this. And most salespeople don't know what that is. And that's the, that's a problem. That's the curiosity. Why are you standing in front of me? Absolutely. Well, speaking of preparation, coming up next month in Nashville, you have the Sales Leadership Summit. Yes. Talk to me about that. That's a, that to me is, is one of the best sales trainings I have ever attended. I do try to attend them regularly. I love what you guys cover. Why don't you give me a little bit on what is it that you're going to be covering this year and how, you know, our audience, you know, I think it's great if they were to participate in this and how they could participate. Yeah. So there's two different, let me start with the participation. There's two different ways to participate. You can be in live with us in Nashville. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing live events again. And I think this is like the first major live event in like 18 months. Um, but we're, we're in person in Nashville or you can be online with us. We're going to have kind of a hybrid event, which is great. Um, what we're going to be talking about and, and, you know, we talked a long time about what do we what do we talk about here? What do we teach? And what we came up with was uh, this word pivot, which makes me think of a scene out of the TV show Friends. Pivot, pivot. But anyway, um, we've had to pivot as an industry so many times and we don't think that's done yet. So we're going to cover the five top pivots that a sales leader should be preparing for and how to prepare for them. Everything from margin uh, to recruiting for a downturn and the next upturn. We're going to be looking at uh, how to, how to manage your, your time, how to, how to staff. I mean, it's really uh, pretty robust on that, but it's all mm -hmm. in the essence of how do you make quick change happen? One of my favorite topics, Anthony is actually going to be, where uh, Amy O'Connor, Michelle Bendine, and I are going to discuss what we call rapid response skill development training. And this is, as opposed to like that proactive, oh, we're going to train on this because this is coming in the future. It's, uh-oh, I just saw something go wrong. We need to fix it. Or, hey, we got a quick policy change that's happening. Let's get our team prepped for it. So we're going to be getting into detail. And we see a lot of people just kind of on that one. <laughs> so lots of good stuff, as you can tell, I'm excited. 
Well, I'm excited. I'm going to be attending. And for those of you listening, you can learn more at jeffshore.com. And again, it's going to be both online and in person. So it's worth the investment. Uh, the information and education are excellent and actionable right away in your business. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being on our program today. I always love having you on. You have really great insight. And for our listeners out there, I hope you found this helpful. So thanks for being on today and we'll see you next time on the Sales Lab. Thanks.